It was the month of May. The spring of 1915 was running out. The spring offensives were turning into summer battles. There was no end in sight. Nothing like this war had ever been seen. It defied prophecy, it defeated understanding, it had escaped from the control of man. For nine months now, every human endeavor had gone awry. For nine months, all man's reason, all his ingenuity, all his science had produced only destruction beyond imagining and sacrifice counted already in millions of lives. A thousand years of civilization seemed to be visibly crumbling. The insatiable guns incessantly demanded new victims. At sea, underwater weapons struck at the roots of a sailor's courage. On land, the coming of gas, poisoning the very air that men breathed, seemed to reduce to nothing the virtues of bravery, enterprise and skill. Not only the soldiers awaiting the dire chances of each day in their squalid trenches felt the war's impact. It reached into every village and street with its demands for guns, for shells, for men. It uprooted tradition. It brought pain, hardship, opportunity. Above all, change. Now, Britain's years of tranquil security were over. The awakening of the British people was abrupt and brutal. It first took the form of scandal, a munitions scandal, when the news broke of the army's desperate shortage of shells. The Times quoted Sir John French, commander-in-chief of the British Expeditionary Force, saying, the want of an unlimited supply of high explosive was a fatal bar to our success. The Daily Mail, the biggest newspaper in the country, deepened the sense of shock by attributing the famine to the nation's idol, Lord Kitchener. This was sacrilege, yet the British were becoming uneasy. For months, the best of their manhood had been pouring into the recruiting offices. It was Kitchener's own summons they had been obeying. The towering hero of legend, K of K, Kitchener of Khartoum. Surely Lord Kitchener could not have sent the army into battle without shells. The shell scandal was only part of a deeper unease about the whole conduct of the war. Lloyd George, Chancellor of the Exchequer, wrote, there was a sense of revolt against the attitude of the government and what was regarded as its leisurely and take-for-granted attitude in dealing with vitally serious matters, matters of life and death to the whole of the Allies, to the British Empire and to hundreds of thousands of gallant young men who had offered their lives to their country. On May the 26th, Britain's leadership changed. Asquith remained, but his government was now a coalition of liberals, conservatives and Labour. And there was another innovation. The Prime Minister has decided that a new department should be created to be called the Ministry of Munitions, charged with organising the supply of munitions of war. Mr Lloyd George has undertaken the formulation and direction of this department. For a moment, the mood of 1914 was displayed once more amid the facts of 1915. Italy declared war on Austria and crowds packed the streets of London to celebrate and to cheer Italians going home to join up. Cheering was not enough. Within five days of his appointment, Lloyd George was rousing the nation to face reality. We are fighting against the best organized community in the world the best organized, whether for war or for peace. And we have been employing too much the haphazard go-as-you-please methods, which, believe me, would not have enabled us to maintain our place as a nation, even in peace, much longer. The nation now needs 
all the machinery that is capable of being used for turning out munitions or equipment, all the skill that is available for that purpose, all the industry, all the labor, and all the strength, power, and resource of everyone to the utmost. War had outgrown battlefields. It had become the test of a nation's technology. The making of a shell case involves the metal trades, blast furnaces, steelworks, iron and steel foundries, forges, stamps, drops and dyes, rolling mills, drawn rod and wire works, and behind them the colliery and the iron ore quarry. It requires factories, and these in turn require machinery-covered electrical plant, factory equipment and machine tools, engines, pumps, turbines, road and rail transport, boiler making and constructional engineering work. The explosives for filling and propelling the shell from the gun involve the output of chemical works, dye works, gas works, and a great deal of very careful laboratory experiment, investigation, and testing. Germany lacked none of these things. Her industry, like her army, was organized on the grand scale. Her swift industrial growth had been based on science, on the ruthless exploitation of new ideas. Before 1914, German chemistry had supplied Britain with dyes for dresses and aspirins for headaches. Now, Britain had to build her own chemical industry. There was a serious explosives famine, and without explosives, a shell was, in Lloyd George's words, just a harmless steel vase. Equally, it was harmless without a fuse. There were more than 50 parts in a shell fuse, parts that had to fit and work as accurately as clockwork. It was the big German clock and toy industries that made the fuses for the Jack Johnsons and coal boxes, which crashed on the British trenches. But in Britain, industries capable of mass-producing fuses were few, and too much of her equipment was out of date. While Kitchener recruited the new armies, Lloyd George began to create new industries. On May the 27th, he walked into his office at the Ministry of Munitions to attack his colossal task. There was a table. I forget whether there were one or two chairs, but by the orders of the Board of Works, there was no carpet. I believe I had a greater struggle over getting a carpet than I had over getting 50 million pounds for munitions. I said to my assistant, look at that table, look at those two chairs. Yes, he said, well, what is the matter with them? I said, those are the Ministry of Munitions. In France, the problems of the home front were even worse. A sixth of her industry lay in German hands. Mobilization had drained France of fit men. More than a million of them had already been killed, wounded, or posted missing. Behind the zone of the armies, France was now a country of women and old men and children. Women delivered the post and the newspapers. They drove the massive machines that watered the Paris streets and laid the summer dust and swept its ancient gutters free of refuse. Those Frenchmen who had idolized womanhood had to get used to seeing women in all kinds of unnatural and unromantic jobs.
The women of France farmed the rich soil with the same love as their menfolk, but they could not supply the same strength and skill. French land produced less food and prices began to go up. To the kill, but only the first are served. Fruit and vegetables are still in good supply, but dearer than last year. The prices at the central markets are much higher than at the end of last year. Cabbages cost 60 or even 70 centimes each. Prices of groceries are also increasing by leaps and bounds. At Corby Market, the average increase is about 300%. The burden of shortages and rising prices fell heavily on France's poor families, many of them trying to live on a soldier's pay and allowances, or even worse, on a widow's pension. But the nation was still welded together by the patriotic flame of the Union Sacre. The French solved the problem of munitions with the same courage and resourcefulness that had turned defeat into victory on the Marne. This nation of individualists submitted to government control, and by the end of 1915, French industry was sending the army most of the munitions it needed. Women were the key to success in the factories. They have quickly adapted themselves to this delicate work for which they seem to be specially suited. Many of them have accepted fairly dangerous jobs like the handling of fuse detonators or explosives. Today, shells are being almost entirely finished off by women. All are working very hard, many of them with serene looks on their faces. Some, on the other hand, look grim. They are probably thinking they are helping to avenge some dear victim of the war. And a few hundred miles away, German women were working with equal devotion. The Germanic empires were now a beleaguered fortress, cut off by the British blockade from the wheat lands of America and the beef of the Argentine. Behind the victorious troops of the German and Austrian armies, who stood everywhere on enemy soil, life was becoming greyer and grimmer. Since January, bread had been rationed, and it now included potato flour. One met people who had come from Berlin and who said that one could not see any signs of a war there. They must be blind. Bread cards are not the only outward and visible sign of the war. Did you ever see a private soldier, accepting a few orderlies, in Unter den Linden in peacetime? It is full of them now. Not very warlike in their clothing, carriage and appearance, many of them wounded, all of them feeling and acting as the chief personage of the drama, as well they might. Vienna remains a city of pleasure, but in its dark suburbs, misery is on the increase, and the mothers wring their hands beside the beds of their children, because their young lives are threatened by enteritis, caused by eating the horrible war bread. The bread ticket did not favor fair share. It was not meant to. I had no difficulty anywhere in getting all the wheat bread I wanted. It was taken for granted that I belonged to the class that did not have to eat war bread. The British knew nothing of the horrors of retreat and occupation, of casualties counted in hundreds of thousands. But their cost of living was rising fast. Bread last year was twopence three farthings, and is now fourpence halfpenny the two pound loaf. The price of meat for baking had doubled in price. That of the cheapest cuts for boiling had trebled. I hardly know how to make ends meet. I have five children and am expecting another in June. We are eating less and have pawned many things to make up the difference between prices before the war and now. But that can't go on. In Britain, too, the burden of the war was falling most heavily on the poor, and the poor included the families of serving soldiers. It was times was very, very hard, and I only had 12 and 6 a week, and therefore I couldn't go out and spend like anyone else. And I used to sit at night and try to do a bit of breathing or a bit of sewing with my hands to pass the time away like that. But it was very, very hard, and uh, my times would wonder, and wonder what he was doing, or if he was thinking about me. 
and uh, wondering how he was going on when I should when I should see him again and all things like that. A private's pay was small. So were the allowances for a wife and children. Any official delay in payment meant a trip to the pawn shop. Death or mutilation in the country's service could mean utter poverty for the hero's family. A royal warrant issued by Lord Kitchener said, a pension or gratuity for the dependence of a deceased soldier shall not be granted as a right. It shall not be granted or continued when the applicant is proved to be unworthy of the award in the opinion of our army council, or unless the soldiers' services were in their judgment such as to justify the award. To the middle and upper classes in Britain, the war was still something to read about in the newspapers or on a poster. The town is vibrant with the call to arms. Posters appealing for recruits are to be seen on every hoarding, in most shop windows, on omnibuses, tram cars and commercial vans. It was strange at first to see officers in uniform in the omnibuses and trams, but the novelty of it has long since worn off. The cartoons of Bruce Bairn's father, an officer serving in France, appeared regularly in The Bystander. They created a new national image, Old Bill, the long-suffering soldier whose sour humor rose above every danger and discomfort. O oh, star of Eve, whose tender beam falls on my spirit's troubled dream. Give it a good hard and bird. You can generally hear them fizzing a bit first if they're going to explode. Well, if you know of a better hole, go to it. Hey, what was that, Bill? Trench mauler. Ours or theirs? And to think that it's the same dear old moon that's looking down on him. This stinking moon will be the death of us. Well, Alfred, how are the cakes? As old Bill bestowed his advice on young Bert, the newcomer, the more frightening the danger, the funnier the joke became. Even soldiers laughed at these cartoons. People at home found them very reassuring. The reality was a long way away. They hadn't any conception of what it was like. And on occasions when I did talk about it, my father would argue points of fact that he couldn't possibly have known about because he wasn't there. And that, I think, was probably the general sort of approach and air of the public at large. They didn't know. They hadn't any conception. How could they? They knew that people came back on leave covered with mud and lice. But that was as far, they had no idea of what kind of danger we were in. I think they felt that the war was one continual sort of cavalry charge, that one spent all day and all night chasing Germans or they chasing us. And I, had they realized the strain of sitting in a trench and waiting for something to drop on one's head, I don't think they would have considered it war just play. And, of course, the general idea was that England couldn't possibly lose. Officers on leave noted how little the middle classes had been touched by war. In spite of the number of men in uniform in the streets, the general indifference to and ignorance about the war was remarkable. The universal catchphrase was, business as usual. Against this background of business as usual, Lloyd George toured the country to see conditions for himself and to drive forward the industrial revolution which would give the troops the shells and guns they needed. He used all his personal magic, all his ruthlessness. In 1915, I drove Mr. Lloyd George, when he was Minister of Munitions, on his munition tour of Wales going from town to town. And when we arrived at Newport in Monmouthshire, just as he got out of the car, someone in the crowd shouted out, why don't you send out some guns? Instantly he replied, why don't you come and help? While Lloyd George was touring the country, inspecting, persuading, energizing, 
the mood of the British was changing. They were becoming grimmer, more bitterly resolved to strike Germany down, no matter what the cost. The violence of war had begun to touch them, too. On May the 7th, Britain had been stunned by the news that the great liner, Lusitania, had been torpedoed and sunk with the loss of over a thousand lives. Then the survivors arrived at Liverpool with stories of the ship's last moments. There was a dull, thud-like, not very loud, but unmistakable explosion. As I ran up the stairs, the boat was already heeling over. Just after I reached the deck, a stream of steerage passengers came rushing up from below and fought their way into the boat nearest us. They were white-faced and terrified. I think they were shrieking. There was no kind of order. The strongest got there first. The weak were pushed aside. No children could have lived in that throng. A mass grave was dug for the victims in the Irish town of Cork. And indignation at this apparent act of German frightfulness flared across the country. There was another side to the story. The ship was carrying a small consignment of rifles and shrapnel shells. And her captain had ignored Admiralty instructions on how to avoid known dangers. The German government had advertised in the New York papers that passengers travelled at their own risk. Nevertheless, anti-German riots exploded in the big industrial towns. Any shop with a German-sounding name was good for looting and smashing. Groups began to form, and uh, somebody rushed round and said Keppel's pork butcher's shop had been broken into by a crowd of women, and all the eatables stolen. Well, I happened to be walking down this street, and from nowhere came a great rush of women in clogs and shawls, and stood outside this draper's shop, shouting and shaking of fists. And um, an old woman stepped forward out of the crowd and threw a tin can at the window. Well, it bounced off harmlessly. And uh, that might have been a signal of command. The, the other women threw the shawls back, produced half bricks that they'd been concealing under there, and a fusillade of these, these missiles crashed into the window. Not even women were spared. A frightened German woman came out into the street, eager to get away unnoticed. Her nervousness attracted attention. Harpies jeered at her, tweaked at her hat, grabbed at her purse. Air raids sharpened the bitter hatred of the home fronts towards the enemy. For the first time in history, bombing from the air placed under fire the populations of cities far from the battlefield. Women and children were being killed, French, German, and now British. The Zeppelins first came to England on the 19th of January, 1915. On the 31st of May, they bombed London, capital of the empire, for the first time. Behind their indiscriminate progress, the raiders left homes wrecked, lives shattered. The word non-competent had lost its meaning. The rage against Germans mounted, even those who were long naturalized British subjects. A hate campaign was deliberately worked up by John Bull, the magazine with the largest circulation in the country. By this time, we begin to know our Hun. The Hun is always the same. Yes, always the true son of Cain, the man of blood. Though his skin is white, his heart is black. 
every employee of the state in government or in the services of German birth or parentage should be forced to resign. The innocent must suffer with the guilty. In every country at war, hatred like this seemed natural, even reasonable. The enemy was portrayed as an ogre of horrifying monstrosity or as a discomfited clown. Dark neuroses lurked beneath the surface of civilian patriotism. Yet the patriotism was real enough. It inflamed the hearts of women as well as men. Some of its manifestations were unpleasantly hysterical. There were women who felt it their duty to force men into the services by every device of scorn and blackmail. I went to the music hall in civilian clothes on one leave, and uh, glass lined up outside. A lady come along, and up 35, and put a white feather into my hand. I looked at it, felt very disgusted, and there wasn't much I could do about it. As well as being given white feathers, there was another method of approach. You would see a girl coming towards you with a delightful smile all over her face, and you'd think to yourself, my word, this is somebody who knows me. When she got to about five or six paces from you, she would suddenly freeze up and walk past you with a look of utter contempt and scorn. If she could have spat, she would have spat. She just did not do that. And that was far more hurtful than a white feather because it made you curl up completely and there was no reply because she walked on. Thousands of other women found their patriotic outlet in Lloyd George's munitions program. These girls uh, were drawn from domestic service, mills, and shops mostly. A lot of very young girls there, and young married women, who had come principally to help keep their homes together when their husbands were away, and also many of them felt that they were helping the war effort very much. In Britain, more and more women took over from men as this industrial revolution gathered speed. By the end of 1915, there were 73 national munitions factories, as well as the armaments firms and all the privately owned industries converted to war work. American machines and British improvisation were the tools with which Lloyd George achieved success. The skilled craftsmen gave way to the machine minder. Victorian methods gave way to mass production. In the closing months of 1915, the National Factory's combined output was 200,000 shells, nearly all of the lighter natures. In the following year, 1916, their total output was nearly 7 million, more than half of which was medium and heavy shell. Not only in munitions did women take over more and more jobs that had always been traditionally a man's. They repaired gas holders. They shoveled coal into the retorts that made the gas. Heavy work, hot and dirty. The first women conductors appeared on buses and trams. Middle-class girls, too, left their sheltered life in the home and went to work as clerks in offices or became nurses. For women, the war marked a social revolution. It was terribly hard, terribly monotonous, but we had a purpose and we meant to do that work, and we did. There wasn't a drone in the factory, and every girl worked and worked and worked. I didn't hear one grumble, and I hardly ever heard or knew of one that stayed out because she had her man in mind, and we all had 
I myself was working with sailors' wives from the three ships that sank, Abuka, Cressy, Hogue, and it was pitiful to see them. If anyone had a letter from France, we just read it, and we got to know all, all the, the, the girls' the sweethearts or, or husbands. We got to know all their Christian names. And we were, when we used to go into the factory in the morning, how's Tommy, how's Dick, how's so -and -so? Have you heard from him? Of course, some would shed a tear and say they hadn't, which meant what, you know, what had happened to them. Wages were good, and some of the public resented this. They thought the girls in munitions were getting above themselves, forgetting their place. We as munition workers were heartily disliked by the general public. You'd go down the street, and people would look at you and say, huh, one of those munition workers. Anything derogatory that could be said about you was said about you. It was very uncomfortable sometimes. And um, I think, as a general rule, the idea was that you made such enormous amounts of money and other people didn't. The most dangerous work of all was filling the shelves with explosive or making the explosive itself. The clothing we wore was fireproof, the shoes were fireproof, and every time we went out to a meal, we had to take all our, out, our fireproof clothing off and put on our outdoor clothing, which took time from our dinner hour. And again, we were searched when we returned in case of um, cigarettes, matches, or pins, etc. Once or twice we heard, oh, so-and-so's gone. Perhaps she'd made a mistake and her eye was out. But there wasn't any big explosion all the time I was there. We sang. We made the little pellets, very innocent-looking little pellets, but had there been the slightest grit in those pellets, goodbye. We got home and we had a lovely good wash. And believe me, the water was blood red and our skin from then on was perfectly yellow. Right down through the body, legs and toes and toenails even, perfectly yellow. These women were called canaries. Their devotion was essential to the success of Lloyd George's armaments program. Through no fault of their own, they were also the cause of one of Lloyd George's toughest problems in 1915. The men, the trade unions, saw them as a threat. A threat to privileges built up painfully over decades and jealously guarded. Unskilled women working machines were a threat to traditional craft skills and methods. They were a threat to the future livelihood of men bargaining with employers, employers who could make huge profits out of the war. The trade unions fought hard against the introduction of unskilled workers. Dilution, it was called. Resolved. But we refuse to entertain the proposal to allow the introduction of semi-skilled workers on work now done by fully qualified mechanics. Resolved that no woman shall be put to work a lathe, and if this is done, the men will know how to protect their rights. Each month of 1915, the number of strikes rose, from 47 in February to 63 in May. The disputes over dilution took place against a history of a hundred years of bitter industrial struggle. For the first time, the trade unions no longer represented the underdog. Now there was full employment. The workers were essential to the national effort. For the first time, cabinet ministers sat down to negotiate as equals with trade unionists. It was yet another revolution. It took a firm government promise that pre-war methods would be restored at the peace, together with an act of parliament controlling the whole field of arms production, including the booming profits, before the trade unions accepted dilution. To Lloyd George, drink was another enemy, insidiously undermining his campaign for higher production. Beer could be bought in public houses which stayed open all day. Was this not a peril to efficiency? Was it not a cause of absenteeism? A new war regulation limited opening hours, and so the British pattern of life was changed in yet another way by the need for shells and guns. A slow business, a hard task, 
to uproot the habits of a nation steeped in tradition, over-affectionate towards old customs. Yet the king himself, symbol of one of Britain's most revered traditions, helped the change forward. He toured the industrial areas without fuss or pomp to persuade the workers that they too were performing national service. Without an adequate supply of shells, we cannot hope to win, he told them. As an example of self-denial, he signed the pledge and alcohol vanished from the royal household. He visited the wounded in hospital and the homes of their families. The king spared no effort to bind the monarchy and people together by shared experience. But the impatient war was clamorous with needs, and soldiers paid with their lives when design or manufacture faltered. The money was raised by five shillings a week for everybody, and then they introduced a bonus system. You filled so many shells, and after that amount had been filled, you got a bonus for how many more you filled. This was a very bad thing, really, because it led to carelessness. People were not careful. The shells would come back to us as either too heavy or too light, and, and that was, of course, a very bad thing because they might fall short when they were fired. At present, our high explosive for 18-pounders is so unreliable that we cannot use it in large quantities. We have lost 36 guns in a month by premature explosions. This represents the highest percentage of bursts ever suffered by any artillery on both sides in this war. Even by the end of the year, most of the shells issued to the troops were the result of orders placed under the war office system which Lloyd George had so attacked. A third of them came from American and Canadian factories. Not until 1916 could Lloyd George's colossal program produce war material in overflowing abundance. Nevertheless, the British were rousing themselves, flexing their dormant muscles. Civilians and soldiers, industrial as well as military might, the Allies were moving into total war. <laughs> 